Good afternoon, everyone. I think we'll just wait another minute or two um, as folks are logging in. I got a few emails requesting the Zoom link again. So I think we'll have a few more and then we'll get started. Okay, um, so why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this task force meeting. Um, I'm going to, uh, after kind of doing a roll call, we'll turn it over to Representative McNamara and Senator Kreider to say um, some opening remarks, and then we will dive right into the meeting. Um, but I'm gonna go through the list of task force members, and um, if you could just unmute yourself and let us know that you are on the line. Um, so Representative McNamara. I am here. Great. Senator Kreider. I'm here also. Uh, Representative Barrett. Okay. Um, Stephen Balco. Balco. Present. Thank you. Cirilla Blackman. Uh, present. Great. Uh, Sheriff Campos. Okay. Representative Cook. Okay. Um, Bernice Corley. Okay, trying to scroll through. Um, Allison Cox. I'm here. Justice David. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Representative Davis. I'm here. Terry Decker. I'm here. Great. Uh, Senator Ford. Present. Um, Judge Graham. I'm here. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, Judge Kenworthy. Okay. Um, Christine Curl. Here. Thank you. Uh, Judge Kirikoff. Susan Lightfoot. I'm here. Thank you. Um, uh, Chase Lyde. Okay. Um, Senator Melton. Okay. Uh, Rudy Monterosa. Chris Naylor. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Senator Kadora. Representative Shackelford. See her on the screen. Um, James Taylor. Here. John Travis. I'm here. Um, Nancy Weaver. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here. Good afternoon. Um, Kia Wright. Hello. Hello. 
Um, and uh, Chief Bolin. I'm here. Hello. Um, anyone that I might have missed on the task force? Representative Devon. Sorry. I'm on a subcommittee, but I just wanted to say happy birthday to Senator Ford. Always welcome. We always like those kinds of well wishes. So thank you. Um, anyone else that I have missed? Hi, uh, this is Rudy Monterosa uh, from South Bend, Indiana. Happy to be here. Sorry for my tardiness of it. I was in another meeting with. No worries. Thank you. And I know Representative Cook is going to be in and out of the Zoom. He just let me know. Representative Shackelford, I see you on the screen if you want to say hello. Okay, maybe there's audio. Um, we'll work on that. Um, but I will turn it over to uh, Representative McNamara and Senator Kreider. Good afternoon. Um, and thank you everybody for taking the time out of your day to uh, work with us on the uh, task force uh, and sharing your time with us over the uh, next few months um, and the work that you've already put in. Um, today we're going to have the opportunity to uh, see some of the information from the data collection as well as uh, the first working group and um, just want to express my thanks to you and, and uh, your input and uh, your time in helping us work on this project. I will just say ditto, uh, very well said. Um, I, I know that the timeline is aggressive and uh, we're thankful for the participation we've seen thus far. Look forward to um, hearing the recommendations and also distilling those down into hopefully a uh, legislative proposal uh, later this fall. So thank you for your participation. Great, thank you. And just for folks looking at the screen, um, I'm Nina Solomon with the Council of State Governments Justice Center and a number of my colleagues are on the line as well. Josh Weber, Stephanie Shaw, Emily Rogers, and Andrew Byram are on the line who all obviously have been working with you um, in a number of different ways from the working groups to the task force to the data analysis. So I wanted to recognize that they are on the line as well and we'll probably have um, things to say during the presentation, but um, want to echo the, the welcome and thank you all for taking the time to join us this afternoon. Um, we will try and get through this information in less than three hours, but we always want to create some buffer um, and hope that we do have a robust conversation and a discussion. I know it's much harder to do that virtually compared to us meeting in person, but really want to encourage folks to provide their reactions and their thoughts as we go through the presentation. And um, so we can have a, a conversation and dialogue um, as much as we can in this kind of format. Um, so today we're going to present findings on the front end of the juvenile justice system in Indiana. We're going to look at referrals, who's coming into the juvenile justice system, through adjudication, who is getting adjudicated um, in the juvenile justice system and what are the requirements that they're receiving as part of that adjudication. Um, the findings are informed by focus groups and interviews that we've been conducting over the last few months, as well as the focus groups and interviews that we conducted as part of the preliminary assessment. Um, and it's also being informed by case level data analysis. And I'll go through what data we looked at for this presentation um, in a, a little bit um, when I share my screen and go through the slides. Um, I also just wanted to start before we get into the data by providing again, just a high level overview of the assessment process um, and the process that are that's gonna lead up to the development of the recommendations that Senator Kreider mentioned. Um, so I, I wanna reiterate, um, and I think we've said this a couple of times, but uh, the Council of State Governments Justice Center is really here to serve as support staff um, to this full task force, to each of the working groups, um, really to provide um, this kind of analysis, um, utilizing your uh, case level data, um, synthesizing information from conversations that we're having from across the state, and also to provide background research, examples from other jurisdictions, help raise some issues for consideration, 
But ultimately, what comes out of this task force is up to the task force. It's really meant to be an Indiana process, Indiana-led uh, assessment process, and Indiana-led recommendations. Um, and so each of the working groups that have formed, um, they have each met once just to uh, get a foundation for this process and understand what their role um, is in this process and what the goals are for that working group. Um, after the presentations, they'll dive deeper into the data and come up with recommendations or solutions that they would like to propose to this full task force. Um, but it's ultimately, again, up to those working groups to decide what works best for Indiana to bring those recommendations to this full task force for consideration in November. And we have that full day meeting scheduled for that conversation. And for this task force to decide through legislation this coming session, what makes sense, um, what you all think is possible and what you all would like to move forward on. Um, and again, we're here to just support you all through that that process and we appreciate that opportunity to do that. Um, so I will start sharing my screen. Um, I'm going to go through just some background in terms of the data sources that we looked at and what conversations we've had over the last uh, couple months to inform this presentation. And then we have four key takeaways on the front end of the juvenile justice system. Um, at the end of each section, I'm gonna stop uh, sharing my screen and we'll have an opportunity for reactions and discussion before we move forward. Um, so before we get started, anything that anybody would like to say up front or um, my team as well, Josh, Emily, others, before we get started? And I can't scroll through everybody, so I'm going to take that silence as a no. Um, okay. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. All right. Can everybody see that? Just to make sure. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right, um, so the presentation today, as I mentioned, uh, is based on case level data analysis as well as focus groups and interviews. For this presentation, we looked at data from two main sources, Indiana courts, racial and ethnic disparity data, um, as well from 2019, which contains information on referrals by offense and by race and ethnicity that were submitted by each county for each fiscal year. And we're looking again at fiscal year 2019. And we're also looking at case level data from the 12 counties that are using the Quest case management system. And you can see those 12 counties listed on the screen. Um, for the Quest counties, we looked at data from 2015 through 2019. Um, and we excluded 2020 for pretty obvious reasons. Um, obviously, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, counties had to change their operations. Numbers might look a little bit different or a little skewed. And so we decided to exclude 2020 and look at uh, 2019 and the previous five years for this analysis. Um, and just to go a little bit more into detail about why we chose the Quest counties as our uh, main uh, source of data for this presentation. Um, so as you all know, and we discussed this in a lot of our previous meetings, that there are multiple data systems that are being used by counties in Indiana to capture case level juvenile justice data. Um, and that these systems are not necessarily talking to one another. Um, so there's Quest, there's SRS, there's Odyssey. There are a number of uh, case management systems that are being used. And given the timeline and the population, and given the timeline, um, the amount of data that we could analyze in that time frame, while also trying to balance that with representation and geography, we decided that using the 12 counties, using Quest would be the best uh, opportunity for us to analyze county level, case level juvenile justice data. Um, we also were able to get access to the data directly through the vendor with agreement for each of the counties which made the data sharing process much easier. And I do wanna thank those folks that are from those counties for, for making that easy and, and approving uh, the data request in a, in a very short time frame and a quick manner. Um, also the Quest counties that you see listed on the screen represent a significant percentage of the juvenile population in Indiana, almost 50%. 
um, and they represent almost half of referrals that are reported to the statewide Indiana Courts RED data system. Um, the counties are also fairly representative of the state in terms of size and geography. They include five small counties, two medium counties, and um, five large counties. And they include counties in the north, south, and central parts of the state. And yes, it would have been ideal if we could have analyzed case level data from each county, um, but we do feel very confident that the data in the Quest counties is representative of what we would see statewide if we had that kind of statewide system available. Um, just as an, you know, and as an example, when we looked at the Quest data and tried to compare it to the statewide data in the court system, and we know that the court system has its challenges in terms of how data is entered and there might be discrepancies, that it was fairly similar in, type, in terms of the types of referrals, the proportion of referrals, et cetera. So we do feel confident that the data is representative. Um, we also engaged in additional focus groups and interviews with stakeholders beyond the preliminary assessment, um, which we did last uh, this past spring and winter um, over the last month or so. So we've had conversations so far with um, four different juvenile probation departments and line level probation officers. We have additional ones set up for the coming weeks. Um, we've met with judges and prosecutors, with sheriffs, uh, directors of detention facilities, um, and we're setting up conversations with detention line staff in the coming weeks, with school principals, and we've had two focus groups with young people. Um, and we're going to try and conduct a few more of those in the next several weeks, as well as with uh, public defenders um, and other uh, stakeholders uh, that we feel will be integral to the process. Um, so I will move into the first key takeaway. And again, I'm going to stop sharing my screen at the end of the next set of slides um, that are focused on this key takeaway. Um, so our first key takeaway um, is that referrals to the juvenile justice system in Indiana are very heavily composed of young people who are committing status offenses, first time offenses, and other low level misdemeanor offenses. And I'll go through some of the data points in this section. Um, and please let me know if it's, if it's hard to see. Um, obviously, we're going to send this presentation out, and I think it'll be posted as well. Um, so in analyzing the data from the Quest counties, we saw an overall decline in the number of referrals to the ju juvenile justice system in, in, as a whole, which is great, um, and a trend that we are seeing across the country. Fewer kids are coming into the front door of the juvenile justice system. Um, an 18% decline since 2015 in the 12 Quest counties. We, saw, we also saw declines in every offense category. Um, so more than a 28% decline in misdemeanor referrals, 7% decline in status referrals, and an 8% decline in felony referrals. Um, and we'll break this down a little bit further into the types of offenses in each of the categories. To, to better demonstrate who is coming into contact with the juvenile justice system. But overall, as a, as a whole, the system is shrinking in Indiana. Um, in many of our focus groups and interviews, we heard the growing concern from stakeholders around a potential increase um, in more serious offenses, uh, violent offenses, weapons offenses, and so we wanted to take a closer look at the referral trends by types of offenses. Um, and what we saw in the Quest counties that for each category of offenses, whether that was non-person, non-weapons offenses, status offenses, or person weapons offenses, is that we saw a decline in referrals from 2015 to 2019 overall. When we looked at the data kind of year by year, we did see an uptick in more serious offenses, those person offenses and weapons offenses in 2018 and 2019. Um, obviously 2020, as I mentioned, is very hard for us to look at and use that as a marker to identify kind of a longer trend um, because in 2020, every type of referral went down for, for obvious reasons during the pandemic. Um, so definitely something to look at in the next few years to see if that trend continues in terms of an uptick in, in person or weapons offenses. Um, but definitely want to recognize uh, folks' concern here um, in seeing those more serious cases in the last few years. 
And I think part of the conversation today will be about how to help Indiana best prioritize and focus on those more serious offenses to ensure public safety and what is the best use of resources and services to really uh, help address that problem. On this slide, we're gonna take a look at each offense type as a proportion of all of the cases that are being referred to juvenile court in the Quest counties um, to show that the majority of cases each year that are referred are for status and misdemeanor offenses. Status and misdemeanor offenses, offense cases consistently account for nearly 80% of all cases that are being referred to juvenile court. And more than half of cases that are referred to juvenile court are for first time offenses. So for example, in 2019, just to take one year, 51% um, of all cases referred to juvenile court in the Quest counties were misdemeanors, 26% were status offenses, and 22% were for felonies. Um, and you can see that's pretty consistent proportion wise um, since 2015, give or take a few percentages. Um, we also tried to look at the top offenses that were um, being referred to the juvenile justice system. Um, and the top five offenses that were referred are truancy, leaving home without permission, theft, battery, and marijuana possession. Um, and so out of those five, you can see that, that one of them is really a, a person offense, the others being either status offenses or uh, theft and marijuana possession, a, a low level misdemeanor offense. Um, and we'll get more into what happens to these cases as they progress through the system in, in our next sections. Um, in, diving, in diving deeper into the status offenses, um, we see that these cases are primarily driven by referrals for leaving home without permission and truancy. Um, and more than half of all status offenses are first time referrals. Um, so these numbers represent the number of cases in juvenile court in Quest counties in 2019, but they exclude, and you'll see that at the bottom, the, the kind of uh, subtext, um, they do not include referrals to the SOCAP program. And just for folks that aren't familiar, SOCAP is a truancy program in Allen County. Um, and while youth are referred to juvenile court, then referred to this truancy program, there are a fairly large number of cases um, that are being referred to SOCAP. Um, and you, if we included that large number of referrals, it would have skewed the overall number. So we decided to exclude those cases from the status offense numbers. And we can talk more about that if folks have questions. Um, and looking at uh, misdemeanor cases, we also see that uh, about a quarter of all cases referred to juvenile court are for first time misdemeanor offenses. And the top five uh, first time misdemeanor offense referrals are shown on your screen. So theft, possession of marijuana, disorderly conduct, criminal mischief, and criminal trespass. Um, and these represent, again, 40% of all of the first time misdemeanors are just for these five offenses. Um, uh, so again, just to raise the question of some of these offenses um, being low level and taking up a lot of resources of the juvenile justice system. Um, and then the last slide in this section focuses on, uh, on younger youth, looking at age of kids that are coming into contact with the juvenile justice system. Um, and while younger youth um, ages 12 and under represent a small proportion of all cases that are referred to the system, there are still nearly a thousand referrals, again, excluding those SOCAP uh, referrals, which would have made that number larger. Um, and for youth uh, ages 12 and under. And these cases are mostly for low level offenses, primarily misdemeanors and status offenses, um, including even youth that are ages six and under. Um, so you can see on the left-hand side, the number of juvenile court cases in Quest counties by each age uh, level. And then on the right, the types of cases. So 34% are status, uh, nearly 52% are misdemeanor and uh, almost 14% are, are felony referrals. Um, and so just to summarize, we see a lot of status offenses, first time misdemeanor offenses that are not necessarily person offenses, more uh, 
property or um, drug offenses, and a number of younger kids coming into contact with the juvenile justice system in these counties in Indiana. And what we know from the research is that court involvement for lower risk kids can actually worsen outcomes um, and, and increase recidivism. Um, and what we're seeing from other states around the country is that more and more states are moving away from formally supervising and serving these types of youth through the juvenile justice system, particularly status offenses, particularly kids under a certain age, and instead are leveraging other youth serving systems and community based organizations to support this population and address their needs. Um, so that's the, the first section just in terms of who is coming into the contact with the juvenile justice system. And so I'll stop right there. I'll, I'll first just turn to my colleagues, Josh and Emily, to see if there's anything I missed in covering that section, and then would love to turn to Representative McNamara, Senator Kreider, and others for, for thoughts and reactions. Okay. <clears throat> this is Josh. Just a quick note, I think folks might be wondering what about uh, demographics and population and, um, and disproportionality, and that will be coming in a later part of the presentation and, and clearly an, an important part of the picture in thinking about how the juvenile justice system is being used uh, in different communities and for different populations. So, so we'll certainly be um, speaking to that and wanna have a robust discussion on that. But this section really is just providing that larger overview. Great, thank you, Josh. Um, so Representative McNamara, I want to turn it over to you just to get your initial reactions, thoughts about um, that data that we just shared. Sure. Did um, you provide everybody ahead of the time ahead of time with the PowerPoint? We did not. No. Oh, okay. So I was just wondering. Um, so I want to just make sure to be clear, um, and you were in when you were discussing that you chose the 12 quest counties because they tend to uh, represent the greater whole. Um, it's Indiana hasn't been easy to collect data um, on, but uh, you're assured that that data uh, is representative of the state. Um, so I want to just make sure that that's understood. But uh, just a general question to those folks here. Um, what is your overall impression um, on the misdemeanor versus a status offense? And uh, what's your first reaction? Um, for some of you, it might be, well, we already knew that. Um, for others of you, it might you know, come as a, a bit of a, a shock too. So just kind of do an open-ended question unless uh, Senator Kreider has anything he'd like to say. No, I think that's a good place to start. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak up on that. Um, I think that what Josh said, that more information on how um, the different systems in the different counties um, use the juvenile justice system will tell us more. Because I know when you take Allen County and you talk about the um, SOCO program, uh, the truancy program, and uh, or you take a Lake County uh, compared to a Marion County, everybody does things a lot different. So you're going to see a lot of different statistics based upon how they do business. I know in Marion County alone, based on the former administration, I know those referrals from schools went down uh, in the past 10 years because of the directive that was given. So I know how that data goes, but I would like to see how that fares to other jurisdictions that have more um, a different type of leadership um, insofar as how they relate to their constituents and the kids and the families, you know, the juvenile families. So I know there is a big difference in smaller counties versus larger counties. So I'm, I can't wait to see, you know, how we break that down and to take a look at what the other counties offer or doing. Nina, Dale here. Um, of the Quest counties, how many were there total? There are 12. And there's 18 counties that have actual juvenile facilities, uh, like um, correctional facilities. Are those all Quest counties, do we know or not? In that? 
Uh, you're talking about detention facility. Yeah. Um, I uh, we have not mapped that. No. I'm just curious. Yeah. All uh, of the no, detention facilities not. are not. Not all counties. Repeat that. Not all of the detention centers are Quest counties. Other thoughts or reactions? I think Nancy, you had your hand up, maybe. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I have a, a couple of thoughts, and and um, but as always, data seems to bring more questions than it does answers. Um, and one of the questions I had, first of all, um, from what we know in the um, 37 counties that are implementing JDAI in some um, form, um, it doesn't surprise me that status and misdemeanor offenses make up the largest uh, um, offense type in terms of referral. I think one of the questions I have is how um, how deeply those cases are penetrating into the system. Um, are, are those cases ending up in the deep end of the system where those, those youth are really the ones who are being placed out of home? Um, and that brings the question, the, the issue or the question about diversion. Because also when we talk about, um, the, I think you said 51% in, in one year, 51% of the um, referrals were for first time offenses, um, you know, knowing what happened before, is there anything that happened before they got to a referral to juvenile court? Or, um, it, you know, was it a um, situation where that's it, the county feels like that's really their only option um, to address um, these kinds of offenses. So that's, that's two of my thoughts. Um, and then the, the Third one is just really a comment. Um, that slide that shows the age at referral that goes down to younger than six, um, that just makes me think we really, really have to come up with a better option. I, I, I can't imagine um, a system in which um, anybody thinks it's the right thing um, to have youth as young as um, that referred to the juvenile court system. So that just makes me, gives me a little fire around, we've got to have a better option. I'm certainly not saying do nothing. What I'm saying is um, there needs to be a better option for those youth who are so young. Thanks, Nancy. I know we have a couple of hands up and you raised some questions about the data that we are going to get into in terms of um, then what happens to these kids. So the, are status offenses getting placed out of the home? Are they being put on formal probation supervision? So we'll We'll get into that. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. Um, Judge Graham and then Susan. I think it's, this is Judge Graham, I'm sorry. I think it's fair to say that I'm not shocked by any of the data that you have listed there. And I, along with um, Nancy, I, I immediately thought, well, for those kids under the age of six or under the age of 12, how many of them are drawn into the delinquency side of the system because action was not being taken on the welfare side, child welfare side of the system. And for all of these status offenses, you know, how many of them are being filed in the delinquency system because um, nothing was happening in the child welfare system. So it would be important to know, again, like because he said, what was happening at, that led up to that referral to delinquency court was the referral made because this was the only system that, that was, uh, you know, willing to take on or respond to um, the, the circumstances. So I think legislation on this side necessarily, I think we have to look at what's happening on the child welfare side as well for these status offenses, especially. Susan, and then I don't know, Don, if you want to respond at all, given your role at DCS, but Susan, I'll, I'll turn to you first. I would totally agree with Judge Graham and, and what she had to say. Um, we are not one of the Quest counties. We're a small rural county. And through JDAI, I have been able to expand a lot of our diversion programs with truancy, with minor domestic situations in the families, and give these kids the opportunity to go through some programming to keep them out of the juvenile justice system. Because I think we all know once they get in, they don't get out. We also have a strong dual status um, system set up here. Um, and I will mimic what Judge Graham said. I can give you an example of a youth, and I emailed Don about this two weeks ago, that it had 50 DCS assessments over the years 
and no services, no substantiations, no open cases. Um, and now we're, they're wanting us to deal with it. Um, we don't take kids younger than 12, but we do offer what we call the FAST panel, which we've kind of set up through um, school justice partnerships. And we're working um, with one of the schools in the county on a 10 year old right now, DCS, um, is initially involved, but we all came together as a community to try to offer up brainstorming ideas, thoughts, uh, ways to get this young lady services and keep them out of our system. Uh, I feel like we do a lot of pushing back on the younger kids. I feel like the status offenders sometimes require more services and more work and more time than the more um, non-status kids, but that's why we try to get them into services rather than anything punitive because that's not what they need. They need services for the trauma they've had all through the years growing up that they didn't have at the time it happened. Just my two cents. Thanks, Susan. And thank you for the opportunity. First of all, I'll say I don't disagree with uh, um, Judge Graham's statements. Uh, um, about trying to find the right services for the right kids. And sometimes that doesn't happen in a very timely manner. So I, I'm not disagreeing with um, what happens. Um, I think the whole um, push, push to the Department of Child Service over the last several years is trying to define those better services and define those moments of opportunities to get the right intervention for children. Just to share a little bit of a national perspective, Nina will be um, talking about this a little bit more, but the experience that folks are describing is what we see in a lot of other states um, and, and what we've heard in Indiana that, that people, law enforcement, um, schools, others are really concerned and well-intentioned about wanting youth and families to get services and have not felt like there's any um, reliable system to get those young people and family services. And so the juvenile justice system becomes kind of a default service provider system. Um, and so it, it wasn't necessarily that public safety was the issue, it was the need to, to make sure that we're helping youth and families. Um, I think importantly, what what Nina said and what the national research kind of consistently shows, unfortunately, is being involved at any level of the juvenile justice system, including if a youth was arrested, even if they didn't even make it to court, has negative collateral consequences. So, so kids who are arrested compared to their similar peers who aren't or kids who are referred to the juvenile justice system are actually, research has shown, more likely to reoffend and less likely to complete high school than kids who get their, again, we're talking about kind of low level, low risk kids who get their needs met outside of the juvenile justice system. And so that's why, and we'll talk more about this, but states have tried to, to be creative and, and work through groups like this to think through if services are our main priority, what options or opportunities or funding streams can be better leveraged so we can focus juvenile justice on the kids that we really are worried about in terms of public safety and, and can focus on meeting other kids' service needs in a different kind of way. So let, let, let me speak from the school's perspective. I, I've been in Warren Township and IPS for 32 years as a social worker and a dean, and I'm over the resource center now. And our resource center is built to provide services to those families and to the children to keep them out of the system. So what we're experiencing right now in Marion County and all over the country, our kids and our families are dysregulated. Um, every school in Indiana, uh, in, the, in the inner city, um, they're experiencing a high level of fights, um, trauma with our children, kids are being suspended, uh, expelled from school, so when we talk about two systems, we talk about DCS, then we talked about the juvenile justice system, schools are defaulting to the juvenile justice system because DCS is not an option for violence, for violent crimes. So the only other option beyond the schools is the, uh, are the, the resources in the community with our police officers. I just left a situation at one of our alternative schools to where a boy attacked the teacher 
um, eighth grader, and, and the ages are getting younger, attacked one of our administrators because the administrator had his phone. So I had to call our police because the kid was destroying everything. And he's one of our EH kids in one of our special programs. So we're offering services, but the services at the time, based on the culture and climate of some of the schools, um, some of our kids are first time offenders and the culture and the climate is dictating their actions. So they've never had fights before, they have good grades, and all of a sudden things are occurring. And let's say we had three boys last week that all got into the same fight. And like I, I talk about things rising to the level of public safety compared to what the juvenile justice system defines as public safety and what schools define as public safety. So in a school of 4,000, if three people get into a fight with three more people, that's a high level of public safety because our teachers and everybody there and other students are at risk. All of that to say, the three boys, one was special ed, so he didn't get put out of school at all based on our special ed laws. The other kid, we offered extra services, counseling and things like that. So he, he got what, maybe 10 days out of school. And the last boy was 18 years old, he got arrested. He went to Marion County Jail and he served two weeks in jail. This was a kid who never had any offenses whatsoever. And all three of them had different consequences for their behavior. Um, and they did the same action. So, so, and what I'm saying is that, so we mean to do the right thing, but the outcomes turn out a little bit different. The mom of the boy who went to jail um, uh, cried. She works at Walmart. She didn't have the money to post bond. And this was a good kid that got caught up in a bad situation. So now that kid has a record, you know, and, um, you know, I had to apologize to the kid today when I saw him for the first time after the event. But at that time, the fight was horrible. Teachers were hurt. A boy's head was busted open right in the middle of school. So we are experiencing a high level of this just in uh, Washington Township, a kid with staff. All of this stemming and emanating from social media, um, there's just so much going on that the schools feel like um, we don't have any control. We're asked to do a lot of things that we don't have the capability of doing. We even have mental health uh, counselors in our schools, and um, but things are still going astray. So right now we're in a desperate state uh, trying to get our kids regulated because of everything that's taken place with the pandemic. Thank you for sharing that. I think also as we get further into the, the conversation and the presentation, one of the things we want to talk about is the varying approaches um, to different behaviors depending on, you know, age, location, geography, all of these different factors, race, ethnicity, et cetera, and thinking through opportunities to expand diversion um, to those young people, like you said, through schools, through community-based organizations, to other, um, other responder models, I guess. Um, and I know Representative Cook is on here as well, um, who is kind of leading the charge uh, along with Judge Gaither on the front end working group and trying to address some of the issues that are being raised right now and, and some of the conversation I think will inform that working group really well. Um, Representative Cook, I don't know if there's anything that you want to add to the conversation given your role as chairing that working group. I know you're um, working through other issues right now as well, so but I'll, I'll see if you want to provide any remarks? Uh, no, other than I think his comments are well taken for us that have been in them. Uh, and I know Wendy can relate to this very well too um, in, the, in the education field. Um, it, it is trying to get what other type services uh, work best and, and hopefully initiated within those counties. We've talked a little bit about the youth assistance types programs that several counties have. And um, that being an option for some, at least uh, now the fighting and the violence that he's talking about is a, is one of the most difficult ones, I think, for schools to, to uh, work through and where to take that, you know, once the officers particularly get involved with that. Um, so uh, we're, we're just kind of at the tip of the iceberg of some of that discussion, but, um, and looking at your data that you're presenting, but uh, we're, we really got it on the radar. Any other 
thoughts or reactions um, to the data or in response to the question that Representative McNamara posed kind of at the beginning of this discussion in terms of um, seeing the number of young people with status offenses um, uh, or low level misdemeanor offenses coming into the system. You know, I have another quick. I have another quick question um, about the data in terms of there was, um, I think some of the slides said they were titled referrals and then some were referred to juvenile court. Does that mean, did that mean that they, there was actually a petition filed or there was some court involvement or was that a referral to the system or is it both? Sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. No, it's a referral to the system. We're not getting into Thank petitions you. filed. This is just coming into contact, cases being referred to court. Yep. Thank you. Hey, this is uh, State Senator Fed Kadura. I have a question <clears throat> that I'm not sure if anybody addressed this. So we're talking about those children uh, post being engaged or at the point of engaging with the juvenile uh, criminal justice system. However, um, somebody mentioned on this call a few minutes ago, you know, about the stabbing, for example, that took place at North Central High School, which is um, where my two daughters go. And one of my daughters was one of the 10 students who witnessed the stabbing. The question that I raise is that there's desperate need in our schools for mental health counseling, for therapists, and for teaching, you know, or for offering services that deal with social and emotional learning. And I'm concerned about the politicization of these types of services that basically end up crippling our kids and not knowing how to deal with their social environments to the point that it leads them to get to the juvenile detention center or to interact with the juvenile uh, criminal justice system. Has there been any discussion, whether maybe in Representative Cook's uh, working group or any other subgroup or through the data about the importance of social and emotional learning? And the reason that I ask that question is that because I'm, I'm hearing some you know, talks that the Indiana General Assembly might be introducing legislation to add, you know, to ban social and emotional learning, which in my view would be counterproductive to what we're trying to do over here in terms of helping our young kids know how to act and how to interact socially, how to develop, how to grow, how to cultivate skills, including conflict resolution and so on, before they end up actually interacting with the system. Has this point been discussed or addressed in this meeting? So no, it hasn't been yet, um, but I, I think those points will be part of the conversation that we have in the, the working group that Representative Cook co-chairs, um, and I can, I'll let him speak more about it. But in terms of thinking about diversion um, and young people who might be coming into contact with the system or at risk of coming into contact with the system, um, we know from the research that those types of programs, SEL, but also restorative justice type programs, um, other programs that help young people learn how to deal with their trauma or regulate emotions are, are demonstrated by the research to be effective in working with young people and improving outcomes. And so as we talk through diversion in that working group, or there is a working group focused on services, looking at community-based and residential services, um, the types of services, the quality of services that really are needed to address all of the um, kind of multiple needs that young people might have, I think those kinds of conversations will, will take place. I think Excellent, thank you. I think it's also important um, just to share um, that research shows not only that um, you're more likely to get worse public safety outcomes if you over supervise low risk kids, but it also shows the opposite, which is that if you provide too little supervision and services to high risk kids, that's likely to increase recidivism also. And so the research really says the reason why it's important to keep those lower risk kids out of the system is it's not only better for them, but it helps make sure that there are sufficient system resources to focus on you know, some of the kids that, that folks have brought up in this conversation. Um, so the research doesn't say, you know, just divert everyone. It says match kids to the supervision and services that are appropriate to their real risk to public safety. And we heard that a lot too in our focus group. So in our focus groups with line level probation officers that have caseloads of young people, we heard from them that they would really 
embrace the opportunity to spend more time with young people and families that are higher risk, that do have more needs. Um, and to do that, they wouldn't, you know, to have that a capacity to do that, these lower level kids, if they would be served elsewhere outside of the system or diverted, they would have more of the capacity and time to do that kind of more intensive uh, work with youth and families, as, as Josh mentioned. So it's something that uh, across across the different probation departments that I've spoken to, which span you know different types of uh, I guess geographies or, or whatnot, um, that was a, a sentiment that was expressed. Steve, David, Nina, can I just interject a comment? I'm not able to to hit the uh, raise my hand thing. Sure. Um, on that point, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm not looking at the uh, West counties, uh, whichever group is working on that uh, probation uh, allocation, reallocation of resources, just a thought. Somebody might want to talk to Nancy Weaver and get a list of the JDAI counties that have turned the probation upside down. I know Boone County is one of them that has made that transition. I think there are a number of other counties, I'm sure maybe one or two of the West counties, but they have already taken significant steps to, to um, minimize uh, uh, the low level, low risk uh, contacts with probation, flip that old time model of one year probation, standard terms and condition. So that might be something that the working group would need to be aware of. Uh, just before I forgot about that, I thought I'd throw that out. Thank you. Thank you, that's helpful. Yeah, Nancy will connect about that. I do know of a couple counties, for example, I think the larger counties, um, Lake and, and Marion, I think are, are working on um, some sort of probation transformation project to rethink um, their juvenile probation system. So we are aware of those, but any other examples uh, that we can leverage would definitely be helpful. Uh, Nancy? Just very quickly, yes, what Justice David's referring to is the um, transforming juvenile probation work that's, uh, it was provided, a, a case, the Casey Foundation, the Annie Casey Foundation provided a framework for sites, and there are several in Indiana that are taking on that work, and it's based on the a, two-pronged premise. One is increasing diversion opportunities, and then the second one is right-sizing probation. Um, I, I believe across the country, not just in Indiana, but probation has become kind of the default disposition um, that everybody gets probation, um, and, and really being um, much more intentional about um, not only who gets to be on probation, but the individualized conditions. So kind of restructuring so there aren't so many standard conditions of probation, um, but being giving the probation officers the ability that Nina, you mentioned, um, to do what they do best, what they are trained to do, rely on their expertise to work with those youth who truly um, um, are a risk to public safety. And then the, for the other youth, again, not doing nothing, but diverting them to something that impacts, that is much more impactful for them and their needs. Yeah, and we're, we're um, aware of that work from Casey and um, have spoken to a couple of those counties that have, are going through that process. And I think um, having those folks participate in these conversations or the working groups and sharing what they're doing and there's lessons learned and how potentially there could be lessons learned that are scaled across the state, I think would be really helpful. Nina? Um, this might be a question for the probate judges um, or magistrates on the call. If you have a child that say it's done some damage and harm, but yet, you know, to let him go back home is not a good thing. Is there a place that you can send those kids to get away from that environment that got them in trouble? How do you handle that case? Anybody? I don't want to speak for, for the judges. I'll let them. I'll let I'm them. sorry. This is Judge Graham. Your question is, if they get in trouble, is there somewhere we can place them outside of their home environment where they got in trouble? I mean, if you know letting them go back home, right, is not good for them because of the recidivism and just in danger because I'm from the South Bend area as well. And we have a lot of gangs and the violence and a lot of shootings and stuff. So how do we protect those kids that need to get away from that home environment to help them? Well, presumably, all of the, tough question. 
Sure, all of the placement options and services available um, to children who are abused and neglected through the child welfare system should be available to children who come into the system through a juvenile del delinquency case. So but you have the same considerations anytime you place a child outside the home, even if they're in a delinquency case, about considering the least restrictive placement in the best interest of the child that's most like the family setting that provides the parents the opportunity to participate in services. So there are certainly some children who come into the system through the delinquency door that are children in need of services in disguise, um, that a lot of it is, is um, it's hard to discern is the child's behavior um, only child related or is uh, quite a bit of it related to the environment that the child's in. So there are options to place children um, outside of the care of the home um, other than secure detention facilities, such as residential placement facilities, shelter care facilities, even foster care or relative care, kinship care, which I'm quite sure all of my, my um my judges consider in, in certain circumstances, but much like um, in child welfare cases, there's no like automatic, you can put them here and it's all, it all makes it better because if you remove them from the home, but you don't fix anything within the home environment, they ultimately go back to the home environment um, and you still have that same issue. So it, it's a very complex and complicated um, system as far as trying to do what's in the best interest of the children and keep families preserved. And those are, those are issues that we'll be discussing um, when we show the data later, um, not today, but in our next presentation around the use of detention and out-of-home placement, um, but that are being discussed by our out-of-home placement and services group, because as the judge mentioned, the research shows that um, you know, to limit out-of-home placement, whether that's in residential treatment or secure settings, um, you know, to, to only those kids that really need to be placed out of the home, but that intensive community-based services that focus on youth and families and repairing harm and, and so forth are really more effective. Um, and thinking through what are the criteria, like the judge said, for placing a young person out of the home in the least restrictive setting um, as a last resort. And so th those are conversations that we'll definitely be having. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other thoughts before I share my screen again uh, to go on to the next section? Okay. Um, okay. Um, so the second key finding or key takeaway from our analysis um, is that there's a lot of variation across counties and both who's coming into the juvenile justice system, as well as how counties are employing diversion policies and practices. Um, and so this goes to an earlier point that was made is what does this look like across the state beyond just the 12 Quest counties and how are counties responding to different behaviors that youth might be um, exhibiting. Um, and so this slide, it might be a little bit hard to see um, the details and, I, and we did that specifically so you could focus on the big picture. Um, this is utilizing statewide data from the Indiana Courts Racial and Ethnic Disparity Data System, um, where as I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation that each county sends in their data um, each fiscal year. Uh, we were able to analyze data by county to look at referral rates overall, as well as referral rates by different types of offenses, felony, misdemeanor, and status offenses. So this shows the proportion of all referrals that um, each of these types comprises. So the first map on your left, um, this is felonies as a percentage of all referrals in each county misdemeanors as a percentage of all referrals in each county, and then status as a percentage of referrals to each county. And what the different colors represent, we divided up the data into quartiles because we weren't trying to rank or compare counties to one another in terms of what is good, what is bad, what's a threshold of referrals that we find to be a, a better threshold. It was really just to show, show variation um, in terms of the percentage of referrals that these different types of offenses comprise. And what you can see just by the different color patterns in each of these maps is that 
there is a lot of variation um, in terms of who is being referred to the juvenile justice system in the types of offenses that are being referred. Um, and we also looked at these different counties by population size, by JDEI, by geography. And you can, you know, from your knowledge of Indiana better than ours, of course, just by looking at a map, you can see there is no clear pattern in terms of who is being referred. So in some rural counties, their cases being referred consist of more status offenses. In other rural counties, that was not the case. Similarly, for urban counties or JDAI versus non-JDAI counties, there was no clear trend or pattern in terms of having more status referrals, more misdemeanor, more felony referrals, but that there is just variation in terms of how counties, uh, in terms of who is coming into contact with the juvenile justice system in each county. Um, I am going to send following this presentation a handout um, and I'm going to give credit to, to our team member Andrew for doing all of this work um, that uh, has all of these maps. Um, if you download that handout, you can dive deeper um, by scrolling over each individual county on each map to see their referral rate and breakdowns in terms of felony misdemeanor status. And it also will give you some other general county characteristics such as population size and, and demographics and so forth. So I encourage you and we'll send that again after this meeting um, to just take a closer look to see the variation across counties and to see again that there is no clear pattern with regard to urban versus rural, north versus south or JDAI versus non-JDAI. Um, in terms of diversion practices, um, and we talked a little bit about this during our preliminary assessment phase as well, um, that there is variation in terms of how counties are using diversion. Um, this slide looks at the use of informal adjustment um, and how it varies across counties, but it is primarily reserved for youth who are committing first time low level offenses. Um, over 90% of cases that receive an informal adjustment and um, this is in the Quest counties again, is a misdemeanor or status offense and nearly two thirds of youth starting in formal adjustment have no prior incidents or referrals to the juvenile justice system. Demographically, we do see that more white youth and more females receive informal adjustment than males or youth of color. And anecdotally, that is a pattern that we have seen in other states and jurisdictions as well. Um, that, you know, females are often seen um, as needing more protection, more services, um, less likely to get further involved in the juvenile justice system. Um, and similarly, and we'll get to this data later when we look at disproportionality, youth of color are less likely to, to be diverted when we look at national data. Um, in terms of some qualitative findings, um, when we looked at diversion policies and practices across counties, um, they do not always reflect um, what the research shows works with regards to diversion. Um, so counties are vary in how they use the Indiana Youth Assessment Diversion Screening Tool. Um, and when it is being used, um, which is not in every case, it is generally administered after the decision has already been made to divert a young person. Um, and these screening tools are meant to be used to inform decisions to divert um, so that diversion decisions are primarily based on risk. Um, when we looked at the data that we received from the Quest counties um, in 2019, the diversion tool was not used in 60% of cases that were referred to juvenile court. Um, so this tool is not being used at the front door of the juvenile justice system. It's often used after informal adjustment decision is made um, and mainly used, um, you know, kind of as a, a either check the box or potentially to inform what the supervision um, will look like for that young person on informal adjustment. Um, we also saw that eligibility for diversion participation is primarily based on offense and not based on risk, um, given that that risk screening tool is not being used at the front door to help inform diversion decisions. Um, and what we know from the research is that um, a youth offense is not very predictive of their likelihood to reoffend. Um, 
we saw that some counties have really robust pre-arrest and pre-court diversion options. And some of those um, examples are being shared in the diversion working group to think through how they could potentially be leveraged and scaled up. Um, but many counties just have informal adjustments as their primary form of diversion. So again, variation in the types of diversion that are being offered for young, young people, depending on the county that they live in in Indiana. Um, we also saw in terms of the types of diversion options or services that youth can receive, that the use of restorative justice is fairly limited. Um, and again, from the research, we know that restorative justice can be an effective tool to not only repair harm between victims and, um, and young people who are committing offenses um, against a, a, a victim, but also to hold a young person accountable for their actions. And, and we see very limited opportunities for restorative justice um, in, in the counties um, across the state. Um, for youth that do receive informal adjustments, um, they are subject to very similar conditions of supervision as young people on formal probation. Um, and while uh, for the most part, when we looked at the data in the Quest counties, young people on informal adjustments have a length of stay of around six months. Um, statute does allow informal adjustments to be as long as nine months because they can be extended for an additional three months. Um, and in terms of services for young people to be, uh, to be used on diversion, we know that the DCS service dollars that are allocated for uh, young people in the delinquency system cannot be used to provide services for young people pre-arrest or pre-court through diversion programs. Um, additionally, um, as I mentioned, we've been talking to a lot of stakeholders across uh, counties ahead of this meeting, uh, probation, law enforcement, schools, and others. Um, and a lot of people have expressed support for trying to divert additional young people, especially those young people that are not a public safety risk from the juvenile justice system and adopting a more consistent research-based approach to diversion. Um, so we mentioned already that the system in Indiana is heavily composed of young people who are committing status and first-time offenses. Um, and Josh mentioned the research around what can happen to low-risk youth um, who are uh, pushed deeper into the system compared to young people who are not involved um, in the court system or are not arrested. Um, and um, while a lot of folks expressed support for addressing um, young people's needs outside of the juvenile justice system, there are questions and concerns around how to get those young people and their family services. Um, and so the conversation that we just had and the conversation that will be ongoing in this task force in the working group is how to act, get youth and family access to these much needed services. Um, before they get into uh, the court delinquency system and the court and to get these needs addressed outside of the juvenile justice system. Um, there were stakeholders as well who do, who do feel like the juvenile justice system should be the place to hold these young people accountable. Um, but again, as I mentioned, restorative justice rather than using punitive sanctions has been proven by the research to be most effective at reducing reoffending, but also to improve satisfaction from victims. Um, as a result of youth behavior. Um, to demonstrate further kind of the opportunities that might exist for Indiana to consider expanding diversion, this slide shows that for youth that are referred to juvenile court for low level offenses or those youth that are younger um, under age 12, in most instances, they don't have a petition filed. Um, this is to, to Nancy's question earlier. Um, and if they do, they are more often than not, not adjudicated, um, which raises the question I think that we've been talking about for the last um, several minutes um, of how beneficial and efficient it really is to refer these young people to the juvenile justice system in the first place. Um, so for example, of, of the status offense cases that were brought to juvenile court in 2019 in the Quest counties, only 24% had a petition filed and 10% were adjudicated. The rest of the cases were dismissed or diverted. Um, these cases did not move forward in the juvenile court process. And similar statistics for first time misdemeanors and youth that are age 12 and under. Most cases do not have a petition filed or an adjudication. So the question is, are there ways to handle these cases without ever being referred to the juvenile justice system 
could these young people um, be handled by other service systems or community-based organizations that can better address their needs without taking away the resources of the juvenile court so they can focus on those more high-risk kids, um, those violent offenses that do present a public safety issue. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen um, and again, turn to um, Representative McNamara, Senator Kreider, um, to, to start the conversation with any initial reactions. I'm having unmuting problems. There we go. <laughs> um, so I think, uh, you know, one of the first things I looked at was the, I think, it, I believe it was the first statement um, that a lot of people were being, um, receiving their at-risk assessment after they'd already been uh, given whatever um, determination. And that was a little bit concerning to me um, because I assumed, you know, when a student was at a, in, uh, uh, I'm, a student, I'm in school right now, by the way, um, uh, when a juvenile finds their way uh, into the the justice system that by dual adjudication, they would have a risk assessment uh, be one of the first things that they uh, encounter. So uh, that, when I saw that was kind of a, a moment for me to sit back and wonder why uh, we have it being done kind of after the fact or after whatever uh, punishment's been doled out. Oh, that was just my first blush that I got from it. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with that. Um, the, the two things that initially jumped out at me as, as we discussed this was the fact that the different systems don't communicate well with each other so that we know uh, when individuals are coming in contact with whatever uh, group is involved, whether it's DCS or whether it's juvenile probation or the school system having a need for uh, services. And, um, and then once they are in contact with the services, um, at what point are they being assessed consistently um, across those systems? And so I think for me, this has already been uh, a significant learning process. And I hope everyone else is kind of getting that same sense is that knowledge is power. And we're, we're starting to, through this project, figure out what's happening in the state and hopefully um, realize ways that we can serve the youth better, uh, perhaps than we have in the past. Nancy, do you have any initial thoughts just looking at, you know, some of the, the variation and the work that you're doing with the JDAI counties in terms of diversion practices? Yeah, I think, um, yes, I do. Um, diversion is, um, it, when you speak about diversion with uh, youth justice professionals, most of the time, um, the informal adjustments, I think one of the slides you said is that's that's a lot of the place, uh, um, the choice um, that they, that an informal adjustment is really the diversion option. Um, and I am wondering about opportunities to move further upstream um, so that um, we move away from, because in informal adjustments as, as the findings also um, indicated, often include probation rules. Um, and can those be, more individualized, can informal adjustments or something le um, less court involved than informal adjustments also be utilized in terms of diversion. Um, the JDAI counties were um, have grant dollars allocated through the legislature. Thank you very much to our legislative partners for doing that several years ago. And a lot of their um, funds do go to diversion because as you pointed out, there's not a, a, um, a consistent funding stream for thing for for youth who are not court involved, um, and so youth can be on informal adjustments and receive services paid for by the Department of Child Services. Um, but for um, other options, um, many of the the communities are using their JDI grant funds to fund those programs. Um, one thing I did want to 
mention on this slide with, that used the data for um, the um, regional ethnic disparities data, I would just um, point out that our partners at the Indiana Criminal Justice Institute, which um, analyze that data and report that to the federal government, they have acknowledged that there has not been data quality checks done on that since the application was developed back in 2015. Um, so just, just a word of caution in terms of using that data to understand really what's going on around the state would be um, something I would offer. Yeah, and I think, sorry, Josh, go ahead. Um, uh, just one, thanks for, for those comments, Nancy. I just thought it might be helpful. I know um, sometimes when, as many of you are, you're in the middle of this, it's hard to envision what something different looks like. And so just to give an example, um, and, and there's lots of different structures that states have implemented around diversion, but to this point that Nancy raised about trying to move further upstream, um, Florida and Delaware are two state examples where they have created statewide what they call civil citation programs um, to keep kids out of the court and keep kids from getting a formal arrest record. So in both of those states, um, kids of a certain risk level or kids who commit certain offenses um, are eligible to receive a civil citation, which becomes basically a ticket to get a little bit more of an assessment and get connected to community-based services um, rather than being sort of formally supervised by probation or going further to court. Um, so that's just one of many models that um, we can share that we'll be talking about in the working groups, um, but just to give you a sense of other states and some of the creative approaches they've taken to try to keep some of these lower risk kids out of the juvenile justice system. So Nina, can I, can I add something to that? So when we talk about going upstream, really going upstream is, is, is connecting with the schools even more so. Um, part of the slide that talked about um, evidence-based practices, how they're not being used. Um, well, most schools engage in evidence-based practices. Um, we look at the models from tier one, tier two, tier three. And we do the universal trainings for all of our kids. So when you talk juvenile justice language compared to school language, I think somewhere from the state's perspective, we have to get on the same page insofar as coherence and kind of speak the same language when it comes to universal uh, precautions and helping our kids. So when I speak to my friends in the juvenile justice system, when I talk about um, second steps and vulva life skills, they don't know what I'm talking about. So uh, when, they, when they start talking, informal probation, status offenses, misdemeanors, we don't know what they're talking about. So if we can somehow bring all of those languages together and kind of take the best out of each system's best practices and put those best practices together. But, but here again, the schools have to be involved on the front end simply because we see what's going on from first grade all the way to the 12th grade. So we're the only group of people or system that tracks our kids that have actual outcomes for 12 years. Whether, that, whether those outcomes are change of behavior and discipline, um, um, grades, attendance, we can monitor all of those outcomes. So even if a kid is tied to the juvenile justice system, that's a system outside of our system, somehow, some way, we're still connected to that kid. And that kid's grades and family, they're all affected by what's going on in that other system. So if we can start talking about utilizing those evidence-based practices and taking one or two best practices from each of the systems that we're talking about, you're talking DCS, you're talking juvenile justice, you're talking school, you're talking community. All of these systems have to communicate with each other. To leave one system out of what we're talking about means that you're not gonna have the coherence that we're the long-term coherence that we're looking for as a community. So. Uh, I'm back to saying schools have to be involved on the front end. I think to me, that's that upstream piece. Uh, Nancy, you may have been talking about something else, but that's how I interpret it. You know, schools got to be involved um, on the front end because we're doing our best to cover all three tiers. You guys only see kids on tier three, mm -hmm. maybe tier two. Okay. So for us, when we do trauma informed care training, our job is to make sure that our people are trained to be kinder, more sensitive, more caring, and to cover all three categories. 
when you all do trauma-informed care training, it's really to put out a fire. So if, if we can all get on the same page, you know, statewide and use some of the same language, I think that'll, that'll help us out a lot. And some of the legislation that was passed um, helps that also. Uh, Judge Graham and then Don. I just wanted to say that I appreciate the maps that you put up there because one of the things I often hear um, over the course of you know, 15 plus years now was um, justice by geography. And I think it's important to note that you know um, you can put in all the, the, the best laid plans and the services and, and those sorts of things, but if they're not available in every single jurisdiction and they're not accessible in those jurisdictions, for example, transportation is much easier in an urban district than it is in a rural district. And you don't have the funds to not only implement those um, programs or services, but to sustain them long term. It's, it is justice by geography. And it just turns out, you know, Tippecanoe County, we're very resource rich. I appreciate Mr. Taylor's um, um, comments about evidence-based practices and involving the schools, um, you know, up in, in Lancey's comments about upstream uh, diversion. So, you know, we have an, a 24 hour intake center. Every kid goes there, they get screens. We can divert kids with mental health issues. We can, we can do informal adjustments. We also have our law enforcement trained up in policing the teen brain training. We, we give them packets that when they, have, they encounter juveniles, they have some discretion on whether or not to arrest and instead refer the family to community services. And we have, you know, working with our schools, we have done teaching the teen brain and we have now a system with our schools and our SROs that we have a uniform notice of offense and certain focus acts that if they're committed on school property, the school, instead of, um, you know, arresting or referring to juvenile delinquency, does direct referrals to community-based services that they would get if they were put on probation. So that, I mean, that's a true sort of diversion upstream. But again, that's one county who's been able to develop that just because of our history of collaboration and we're very resource rich, but that's not every jurisdiction in the state. So anything that, you know, that we're gonna ultimately legislate, it has to be something that is available, accessible and affordable for every jurisdiction or you do end up just with that justice by geography. That's an excellent point. And um, Donald, I wanna go to you next, but I, I think one thing um, that we have been talking about in the working group and that we'll talk about is the notion of justice by geography and trying to develop a more consistent statewide approach doesn't necessarily mean that every county or jurisdiction has to respond with the exact same type of program or the exact same type of service. There is still that flexibility for locales to do innovative work and to implement programs that's demonstrated by research or that are, have promising research behind it to, to address young people's needs. Um, so there is that kind of flexibility and local innovation. It's thinking more about like that consistent response in how to deal with certain young people's behaviors and um, their risk to reoffend. Um, so having some sort of consistent approach doesn't mean that taking away discretion or taking away the ability for locales to innovate. Um, and they know these young people and their families more intimately than, than other people do. And so I just wanted to also mention that as we think about resources and justice by geography and consistent approaches, that those types of conversations are also being had. Yeah. Nina, just to build on your point, and I think Judge Graham saw this in a recent judicial focus group that we had, that I think the, the question that this data um, brings up for this task force to explore, to Nina's point, is not to legislate that every county do things the exact same way, but the, the shift that states have made, like the example I gave with Florida and Delaware, is do you want to create a minimum standard? or a minimum set of expectations. Um, so as Nina said, that, that doesn't stop the exact how or doesn't stop any county from going further and experimenting with different approaches, many of which you know, I know JDI counties have already done in some regard, um, but does Indiana wanna create a standard set of policies and practices and, and to the judge's point, a set of resources to support at least a floor kind of level of a consistency across the state. 
Don. Thanks, Nina. Um, the one thing, there is a slide there that says uh, DCS dollars cannot be used, and that's the allocated funding um, for filed cases. The department does have uh, community partners, which is a diversion process that's available across the state in all counties. Uh, and that's money that's supposed to be available for DCS and probation alike. And maybe that's someplace where we can start looking at you know, programs that could be available through community partners that aren't currently being provided. And maybe there's a better opportunity for education to probation that that actually exists and is a referable program um, for the diversion side of things. So there are DCS dollars that do exist for that. Um, through community partners. So I don't want to disclude that, um, but the, the slide actually spoke more to the, the family and children's fund that, that goes to those referred cases, whether it's informal adjustment or a formal adjudication process. So I don't want to miss the sight of that. No, thank you for clarifying that because we also, I actually had a conversation this morning with um, the head of the Youth Service Association um, and the, talking about the Youth Service Bureaus and how they are a prevention mm -hmm. um, resource that supports young people who are at risk or who do come into contact with delinquency on that prevention side. So the separation of those pots of money and making that clarification, but thank you for, for making that point. And just to build on that and provide another example of how other states have tried to address this, and I think Nancy's comments basically spoke to this, but some states, including, for example, we just recently worked with Colorado, because diversion is such a priority, they established a funding stream specifically for counties, a block grant that is only tied to diversion. And there are some basic research-based requirements that go along with that, like, for example, using their validated diversion screening tool beforehand, as Rep McNamara was saying, to guide those diversion decisions and to divert kids who score low risk on that tool out of the system. But the state has basically said it's in county's interest and it's ultimately in the state's interest to put dollars specifically behind diversion and to incentivize counties and to establish that kind of level playing field. So again, just a, a model that another state has used to try to support consistency statewide. Any other thoughts, comments? questions um, or, re or reactions to the section around diversion practices? Uh, this is Steve David, just briefly. I really, really, really find the Colorado, I believe, model or approach intriguing. Um, and, and so I would, I would hope that we would look at something like that, the block grant incentive. And, and if we're working upstream, big picture thinking for our policymakers is, is what else can be done to keep these kids from even experiencing any kind of diversion. In other words, back to the school setting, back to the, to the home setting, are, are, is there some means by which um, schools can identify, uh, the community can identify, uh, the parents can identify, uh, these at-risk uh, children before they are eligible for diversion in some central hub or some location in which they can get additional services or seek additional services, uh, a, a one-stop shop, a hub. Because by default, rightly, wrongly, for the most part, uh, done a pretty good job. The courts, unfortunately, have found themselves in, in to be in that, that hub and in and unfortunately, that's led to a lot of uh, uh, creativity in getting a kid into the system uh, so that they can be provided services, which is, which is not really what we want to do, right? We don't want to expand the system in order to help children. We want to shrink the children and really focus on the system uh, for the kids that, 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 that is the only alternative. So I really find that Colorado uh, suggestion very intriguing. Yeah, and we'll, we'll, we've shared that example with the working group. And one of the things that we're happy to do as well is to connect folks to people in Colorado to hear more um, about the work that they're doing. They've been doing this for a number of years and this uh, latest uh, bill that passed in 2019 was an opportunity for them to expand that and make it statewide. And so I think folks there would be happy to, to chat with anybody who is interested in learning more. 
you know, I think it would also be helpful. I know we've shared resources with the working group, but um, maybe following the presentation to send some of that information out to this full group um, to read more about examples. Um, to Justice David's uh, point, there's also states that have had um, specific school-based diversion programs, um, you know, crisis kind of intervention, mobile crisis services that are available to schools. There are other states that have done that kind of one-stop shop assessment center model. Um, so certainly you know, a number of creative approaches and, and we can share that information with the full group. Yep, and we'll do that. Great, uh, thank you, Justice David. Um, any other thoughts or reactions before we continue? Um, Nina, I, okay. something just came to me when Justice David was talking. Did any of your data that you came across cross-reference with schools, whether or not the student had an IEP or was in special education programs? No, um, and Emily, I don't know if you could tell even in the Quest case management system if there was a flag for that. I did not see that. It's It doesn't mean that it's not there. Um, I did not request a special education flag this time. Often, that information is more sensitive and um, can be less reliable when it's recorded in the juvenile justice system. Um, but I think it's something that's really important and if that data is available to be able to look at. And Rep McNamara, we do know nationally that um, kids who are in the special education system are more likely to be referred to the juvenile justice system, that kids in the juvenile justice system are disproportionately likely um, to have special education needs, to have been suspended and expelled, to, to be behind in school. So as a number of the folks on this call have brought up, that intersection between juvenile justice and education and having sufficient supports for schools is really important. That's why I asked the question. <laughs> and it also, Rep McMurray speaks to your larger concern just around data um, and how systems interact with one another. It might be something, and, and uh, I don't know, Emily, we'll, we'll see as we get to start looking at the DOC data, if that is a flag. Oftentimes we see that more in facility data than probation data. So it might be something that we can take a look at if it's there. Um, but just another point to raise as we start the data working group to think about what measures are really important for the state to collect about young people coming into contact with the system. Uh, any other thoughts or comments? Hello, Nina, this is Rudy Monterosa from South Bend. Yes, go ahead. I just wanted to share that one of the points that was made in the second part of the presentation that struck me that wasn't, that struck me but wasn't surprising was the fact that you'd indicated that white and female youth were more likely to be referred to informal diversion than their counterparts. And what concerned me was that as um, I would, well, first I wanted to say that as, I hope that as we continue to work together that we are taking steps to ensure an equal opportunity to avoid or to be able to take advantage of, the, uh, advantage of this informal diversion by all parties. And anecdotally, I would share that here in South Bend and in Elkhart, where the majority of my clients are, uh, that my actual juvenile clients may very well speak the English language very well. But I find that their parents don't necessarily have a mastery of the English language and more importantly, may not be very familiar with the way the system works, even for themselves and much less for their children. So there would be times when parents and their children would miss out on the opportunity to engage in this informal uh, diversion program. And because of the fact that they didn't understand what was happening because of the language barrier or because they just didn't understand that this was an opportunity to avoid going to court, would end up in court and that's how then we would get involved. So I, I, I guess I wanted to raise the issue of how this is impacting people that may not have access to our courts or, or necessarily be able to understand what's happening in our courts because of a language barrier uh, as we deal with, with a population that may not be able to speak the English language. Great, thank you for bringing that up. Any, any other last comments? Okay. Okay. Um, so the third takeaway um, from this uh, presentation um, uh, is that 
um, given what we already talked about, um, that the juvenile justice system is uh, composed of mainly young people that are committing misdemeanor and status offenses um, and low risk youth, most cases that end up adjudicated or that end up on some form of formal supervision also consist of low risk youth and youth who are committing lower level offenses. Um, so starting by looking at offenses in 2019, more than half of all adjudications in Quest counties were for a misdemeanor or status offense and 26% of adjudications were for a felony offense. 22% um, of adjudications were for first time referrals. And you can see here kind of similar to the earlier slide when we looked at cases being referred, when we look at adjudications, that trend in terms of offenses is pretty similar over the last uh, five years. In um, looking at risk level, um, so we did look at um, young people's uh, risk levels as measured by the IAS dispositional tool. So this is the tool that it is administrated um, pre-adjudication to inform um, dispositional decisions or what we call dispositional decisions. Um, I think in Indiana, it's more like adjudications with requirements. It's so what type of supervision young people are going to receive as a result of their adjudications. Um, we see that nearly half of adjudications consist of low risk youth um, and 14% of adjudications on the flip side consist of high risk youth. So again, the system is composed of a lot of low risk and lower level kids and a similar trend follows with those young people who end up getting adjudicated. Um, in looking at the requirements that young people receive as part of their adjudication or what type of supervision um, they receive as a result of their adjudication, we see that a lot of young people that start formal supervision are also for those lower level offenses. So 68% of youth starting formal probation supervision are for misdemeanor or status offenses and 28% are for felony offenses. Um, if we break that down a little bit more of youth starting probation, 37% had committed a person or weapons offense and the rest of those young people starting probation committed a non-person or non-weapons offense. Additionally, 41% of youth starting formal probation supervision had no prior referrals to the juvenile justice system. So kind of mirroring that trend that we see on the front end in terms of who is coming into contact with the system in the first place. Um, looking at risk level, um, more than half of youth starting formal probation supervision are assessed as low risk to reoffend. again, as measured by the IAS dispositional risk assessment tool, 32% um, as moderate risk, 2% um, as moderate high, and almost 10% as high risk youth um, for those starting formal probation supervision. So again, a lot of low risk youth being placed on probation supervision. And looking at which youth are adjudicated to some form of out of home placement. Um, and we defined out of home placement as um, Department of Corrections commitment um, in DYS, another residential placement out of the home, or a uh, local detention facility post adjudication. Um, we also see a significant number of youth that are low and moderate risk being adjudicated to some form of out of home placement. Um, so in 2019, 19% of adjudications to out of home placement were for youth that were assessed as low risk um, and 47% for youth that were assessed as moderate risk. Um, and looking at offenses, 10% uh, of misdemeanor adjudications received out of home placement and 28% of youth uh, that received a violation of supervision were adjudicated to an out of home placement. Um, and all of that, those, those three um, out of home placements, detention, DOC commitment and other residential does not include what is a suspended commitment. So a suspended commitment is uh, youth that receive formal probation supervision, but they are also kind of have um, more likelihood to be placed 
in and out of home placement or receive commitment to, to Department of Corrections during any period of time um, of their supervision period. So it's almost like uh, a threat, like if you commit a violation or something happens while you're on supervision, you have more likelihood to be committed during that time period. Um, and 11% of adjudications that, um, 11% of adjudications received a suspended commitment. Again, that's on top of the youth that received an adjudication to an out of home placement. Yeah, in looking at um, technical violations of probation, um, we see that violations of supervision are a key driver um, for further involvement um, in the juvenile justice system. Um, so in 2018, 14% of young people with a post adjudication supervision were placed out of the home um, in a residential facility or were committed to the Department of Corrections within a year of starting supervision. So those are young people that were on formal supervision um, and then were committed or, or placed out of the home while they were on supervision, um, even if that was not part of their initial adjudication. Of the youth placed or committed, 41% did not have a new misdemeanor or felony offense between the start of their supervision and uh, the time of out-of-home placement or commitment. So they were likely committed or placed out of the home due to a technical violation. Um, and we also saw that um, graduated responses or, and incentives are not consistently being used across the state um, to respond or to address to violations of supervision or to reward positive behavior for young people on probation supervision. Um, we have heard of a number of probation departments um, as well as uh, you know, those, those including the probation transformation counties that were discussed earlier that are in the process of piloting a graduated response system, but there is nothing that exists kind of statewide to guide um, county probation departments in how to address uh, probation violations in a similar manner. Um, continuing with some of our more qualitative findings from our conversations, um, and this was discussed in part during the preliminary phase of the assessment as well, is that counties vary in how they use research-based policies and practices to guide their decisions around supervision and using out-of-home placement. Um, there aren't any requirements in statute around the use of the Indiana Youth Assessment System um, and developing predispositional reports that include results of the IAS to inform recommendations for supervision. Um, when the tool is being used, we've heard from a lot of stakeholders that the results of the tool are not given um, much weight in terms of how to best match young people with the right supervision. And a lot of folks raise concern around the validity of the tool um, for the population in Indiana, including whether staff are receiving the right training or whether there is regular quality assurance on how accurate the tool is measuring risk of reoffense or how much the tool is being used across the state. Um, additionally, most counties have very uh, general language in terms of when it is appropriate to use out of home placement, such as using the least restrictive setting, um, but there really aren't statewide guidelines that are more specific in terms of uh, using risk or offense to determine use of out of home placement or guidelines to help determine how long young people should stay when they are placed out of the home. Uh, we also heard from a number of probation staff that they feel like there are there is a lack of it more intensive community based options to provide services to young people. Um, and that the lack of those types of services may lead to young people being placed in residential facilities, whereas if those community based options would be available, they may make different decisions in terms of placing young people out of the home. So I will stop there um, and see if folks have additional initial reactions, um, starting with uh, Representative McNamara and Senator Kreider. I'm gonna let him go first. <laughs> um, just any thoughts on that part? Um, from the general consensus of the group. Okay. 
I, I guess I would be interested in hearing what the group, um, how they feel about the, um, the information. We're starting to get outside of my area of expertise. I'm very interested in what I see, but I, I'm not sure how to measure it. Nancy, I see you, you have your hand up. I have a question about um, the offense levels. So in terms of the, um, if, if there were multiple offenses included, maybe a felony and a misdemeanor, was this by most serious offense? The, the data was reflective of offense category or was it including both or multiple? Emily, do you wanna answer that? The most serious Thank you. offense associated with the case. Thank you, thank you. And then I have another, I have a comment that I think um, is, I appreciate our partners at the Department of Child Services. Um, FFPSA is pushing us in a direction and the Department of Child Services is leading that way in um, helping to think about um, not so much out of home placement, but out of home treatment. The old way of thinking has uh, has traditionally been that out of home placement is kind of on the continuum of um, available supervision. So it's not um, uncommon or wasn't uncommon um, for probation officers to think, well, if, if youth violate probation or violate some kind of technical rule, that the next step, you know, maybe it was an informal adjustment, then formal probation, um, then some other intensive supervision, and then out of home placement. And now we're really being challenge to think about the purpose of placement and ensuring that there is a clear definition um, among, within counties around that being a need for treatment. And I don't know if Don wants to speak to that, but that's one thing that I think is really going to help us as a state um, move toward that um, and, and not using um, out of home placement kind of on our continuum, continuum of graduated responses. Um, the other piece about graduated responses to include in incentives um, is that's a place where there certainly are opportunities and there is research to support the use of non-monetary um, uh, incentives, but there's also not really um, good, and I mean minimal funding, minimal funding to incentivize, you know, whether it's a candy bar or something for, for youth who are doing well, um, that we seem to run into some problems there insights. But again, I know that there's lots of, you know, even the, the positive, um, positive reinforcement in terms of verbal praise is hugely effective, but there's also a little piece where we could benefit from being able to incentivize positive behavior um, for, for youth. I know Don had to step off. I don't, he was going to come back on, but I can't, I don't see him on here right now, but we make sure he, he knows about that, that point. Um, any other initial thoughts or reactions to that data or around um, criteria that's used to make those types of decisions? Um, I don't know, Judge Graham, from your perspective on the on the bench, um, or or Susan from probation's perspective. I think we're getting to the part of the meeting where people's heads are <laughs> are spinning from seeing data. I'd be curious to see what Susan has to say from probation perspective. I guess from my standpoint, um, Judge, we have begun to use more and more incentives and they are very small incentives. I feel like we have always used verbal praise, um, that type of thing, um, but we have been utilizing some gift cards and candy on our desks to offer up when they have a, or a clean screen or have brought their grades up or have completed all their homework. And sometimes just the smallest of things do make a difference. I would totally agree. Um, I will tell you, at least kind of in our county, our judges have wanted to keep the sanctions in the courts and not in probation. So as far as what we use for sanctions, it's typically uh, reporting in more frequently. If we've had bad behaviors or positive screens, maybe we increase the number of screens. But beyond that, we have not had a set sanctions 
uh, grid for our county, and that's adult and juvenile. So kind of kind of works on both ends. Um, and I will also say, and this was kind of to the previous point, um, I very definitely feel like many many counties don't have the rich resources that a few of the uh, more fortunate counties do have. And while I wouldn't say we automatically put kids in residential treatment, I think after you've exhausted all of the community resources and least restrictive situations, that's when you start looking at, okay, what can we do to turn this child around so they don't go into the adult system? Um, and I would agree with Nancy, the new initiative is, is gonna kind of change that whole process and, you know, hopefully many of the counties have looked at it that way to begin with. I mean, I'm old school, so uh, I go back to what statute says and least restrictive and exhaust everything before you go on to something more restrictive, try to keep them in the most home-like setting. But I do know that many counties have never operated that way. So those are the ones that I think are, are the most concerning. Um, and, and how they're handling kids right now. Yeah, so can I piggyback off um, Mr. Lightfoot? I wanna say that and as we talked about the resource for rich counties, um, I would love to have the opportunity um, to witness some of the best practices. Uh, I know I had a chance to listen to Wayne County. Tippecanoe has some great things going on in their county. And I, I reference back to small school districts or counties versus large school districts and counties that uh, some of the smaller districts have a different type of relationship with their judges where they're able to do some of these things with their with the court system. Um, but I think that if, if, if we were able to come together somehow and kind of learn from each other, let's say if a smaller district or county has a really, really good program that we might can scale up in one of our larger counties, um, there's no need to reinvent the wheel when we have some great things going on in the state of Indiana. So I would just like to try to get a little bit of exposure to some of those things that are going on in these other counties. Along those lines, Christine, uh, obviously Marion County is one of those larger counties, but would you be willing to share the efforts that you all have begun to make to kind of think differently about probation, keep those lower risk kids off of probation and try not to have kids penetrate deeper into the system? Sure. Thanks, Josh. No, we in Marion County, and Nancy alluded to this earlier, we are one of the transforming juvenile probation jurisdictions, and we have three primary goals that we're working on locally um, since our work, since going out to Georgetown, and Nancy was part of that team as well, um, to go out there. So our primary is law enforcement diversion. So we have stood up over the past two months, starting July 15th, we actually have a law enforcement diversion program that one of our local um, police districts, our Southwest District, has adopted through IMPD where they are actually diverting youth directly to our local Boys and Girls Club where we have provided funding through the state support of a Title II grant fund to, to compensate for case management. Um, we call it the Restorative Justice Program whereby we actually have um, peace, um, we, restorative justice initiatives included in that um, and actually tracking and assessments and service supports. And that diversion effort was really focused on enforcement at the front end to divert, but then we also built in, if a youth is arrested, maybe it's a situation where law enforcement, either by their own internal or general orders or have some other concerns that they are not comfortable directly diverting to the program, they bring them through our intake operations and, and we then staff that with the prosecutor's office. So it's a very robust collaborative approach. Um, I believe as of last count, um, I think we have just at 30 youth um, that have been diverted directly into that. We've also had from the bench, judicial officer referred directly to the program as well. So we built that in. So we're very excited to see that expansion. And we are looking at, once we firm up some um, of the details of this current pathway, engaging schools in that diversion effort opportunity directly from the front end. So they, they don't come through our processes at all. Our focus point is to have them directly referred to the program so they never um, are named on a list or any sort of um, potential opportunity later that could come back that indicates that they were involved with the system. The second piece of what we're focusing on is truly looking at um, our probation conditions. Um, we've already moved forward with drug testing is no longer a standard option um, on drug testing. So it's really looking at what our current probation looks like 
um, our supervision. And then finally, our primary um, focal point of number three is community engagement, um, youth voice, um, and having the community assist us in making um, suggestions and taking input into how our system works. Um, we also are just kind of adding on to some of Susan's comments and, and I so appreciate her and all the work that's been accomplished um, with, her, with her department. Um, we actually developed incentive boards for our, our staff actually developed their own incentive boards and have each youth listed. And it may be a football theme, it may be um, um, sports related, it could be education related and they actually keep that in their office. And as youth progress through positive, um, positive aspects of their supervision, they actually come in with us. And we've done this virtually through COVID where we will move it for them, but they know we're doing it. And then at the, and when they reach a certain point level, they're actually entered into a gift card drawing. And that's thanks to the support of our state JDAI funding that provided for that. And the research we're seeing back on that is it's making positive impact. So we're incorporating those incentive options into our juvenile justice reform efforts here in Minnie County. I know that was a lot, Josh. I hope I hit what you wanted. No, that that that's great. Thank you, Christine. And, and speaks to James' point about sort of uplifting county practices. Just again, stimulate um, people's thinking and, and give some examples about how other states have tried to address these challenges in terms of lower risk kids, you know, penetrating further into the juvenile justice system and, and sometimes getting placed out of home. Um, Christine went through and we've talked about different kind of statewide diversion models, funding models. Um, states have, have made um, similar policies and practices around probation and around dispositional decisions. Um, so quite a number of states now require that a validated risk assessment is done prior to disposition um, and that a report is shared with the judge, with the prosecutor, with the public defender on the case. So everyone has that kind of data-driven assessment, including oftentimes mental health, trauma information about the young person's risks and needs. And so that um, that information can help guide consistent dispositional decisions. Um, some states have gone as far as establishing dispositional guidelines um, beyond kind of general language around least restrictive alternative to put parameters around the types of kids who can be placed out of home. Um, sometimes that's done by a fence. So for example, uh, the entire state of Texas um, a number of years ago passed legislation to say that a youth could no longer be committed who just um, committed a, a misdemeanor offense. Um, there are other states that have said youth can no longer be committed or placed in any form of out-of-home placement just based on a, a technical violation that doesn't involve a new offense. Um, there are other states that have mandated um, the development of graduated response and incentive systems, but also provided funding streams to support that. Uh, a number of your neighboring Midwestern states like Ohio and uh, Illinois have incentive-based funding that goes directly to counties that provides um, additional funding to those counties that keep kids out of out-of-home placement um, and supports those more robust intensive community-based options that Nita mentioned are missing. Um, so again, a lot of a lot of creative strategies to not take away county discretion and, and professional judgment and and the important decision making that judges, prosecutors, and others are doing every day, um, but steps county uh, states have taken to be creative about policy and to be creative about funding to try to establish that kind of a, a more of a statewide consistent norm. And as Josh mentioned, those examples have been shared with the out of home placement working group um, that Susan is co-chairing, and so we will share those uh, examples as well with everyone on the task force. Any other thoughts, reactions um, to this section around adjudications and supervision? Um, I'll go to the next section. Um, so this next section, um, the last takeaway, um, and we've talked about this, I think, throughout uh, the meeting so far, and we just have a couple slides to really illuminate this point, but that youth of color are disproportionately likely to be referred, adjudicated, 
um, and placed on probation compared to their white peers. Um, so this slide shows that um, in terms of looking at the Quest counties, Black youth represent 22% of the juvenile age population in Quest counties, but they make up 38% of youth that are referred to juvenile court. Um, you can see that that does not exist for Hispanic youth, that 15% of youth in Quest counties are Hispanic, um, and 11% are uh, of Hispanics are, are make up the population of youth referred to juvenile court. And you can see the last bars uh, with respect to white youth. Um, this slide, um, to examine disproportionality and racial and ethnic disparities, what we did, and Emily will be able to describe this calculation in, in much better detail, um, probably less confusing than I'll be able to, um, but we calculated what's called a relative rate index, which provides a measure of disparity in outcomes for different racial and ethnic groups by comparing the rates by which each, out, each outcome occurs in the population of young people that are juvenile age, 10 to 17. And here by outcomes, we mean referral to the juvenile justice system, adjudication, placed on formal probation, or receiving a suspended commitment. Um, and a relative rate index of one means that there is no disparity, and a relative rate index of greater than one indicates that the outcome occurs more frequently um, for Black youth or Hispanic youth. Um, and less than one indicates that an outcome occurs less frequently. Um, so here, what you can see in that line kind of down, uh, that black line down the center of the chart um, is that one line, which represents white youth, um, the, the reference group for the calculation. So here you can see that for referrals, black youth, and this is using Quest County data, black youth are more than twice as likely to be referred to juvenile court than white youth. Um, they're nearly three times as likely to be adjudicated um, they're also more than two and a half times as likely to be placed on formal probation and nearly four times as likely to receive a suspended commitment. There are slight disparities in each of these outcomes for Hispanic youth. Um, you can see that with a relative rate index of a little bit more than one for each of those outcomes. And we will have more of these types of measures as we go further into the use of detention, who is admitted into residential placement and Department of Corrections um, custody. So I'll stop there. Um, I, I know for many folks around the table that data does not come as a shock or a surprise and it mirrors the data that we see in pretty much every state or jurisdiction across the country in terms of uh, racial and ethnic disparities uh, for young people in contact with the juvenile justice system. Um, but I will see if there are any initial comments or reactions um, for Representative McNamara, Senator Kreider, and then obviously others, please please jump in. And, and Josh, I don't know if you wanted to say something else. Yeah, I, I just wanna add, um, uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that, that racial and ethnic disparities is a reason why states have decided to establish statewide policies and, and approaches to these issues but it's certainly a reason to do so. Um, unfortunately, we haven't seen great evidence that statewide policies by themselves address um, the numbers that Nina just went over, but it certainly lays the foundation for making it more possible. And so just as, as we all continue to think about statewide approaches, statewide strategies, what feels comfortable and, and what doesn't, this overriding lens of equity, we think it's just a really important one for this group and for the working groups to consider um, that we talk about resource equity, we talk about policy equity, um, but a lot of the importance of kind of setting that standard floor we talked about or that, that standard expectation of practice and trying to have it be as research-based and data-driven as possible is because we know through, unfortunately, 20 years of, of juvenile justice reform um, that even with that data, it's very hard for systems to not make biased decisions. Um, but putting some of that standardization, some of that data-driven practices in place um, at least allows for the opportunity to make more equitable decisions. And, just an important part of the ongoing conversation. 
Representative McNamara, Senator Kreider, anything to add? And, and also, Nancy, would love to get your thoughts, because I know that a lot of the JDI counties have established equity committees and, and have really started to tackle this issue head on. So I would love to get your thoughts and, um, you know, some ways that your counties have started to talk about these issues more directly. But uh, Rep McNamara, Senator Kreider, anything that you want to just add on this point? Uh, no, I'll be interested to hear what Nancy has to share. Putting you on the spot, Nancy. <laughs> Just going to say the same thing. So um, unfortunately, this data is not surprising. Um, we in the uh, youth justice system improvement work that JDAI has done and continues to do have um, in the past couple of years centered race equity. Um, and we have um, certainly, we have um, we have an implicit bias institute that we have um, started, which gives um, local sites an opportunity to be trained in in and and how to train around implicit bias. But probably more importantly, in the last couple of years, um, we focused on doing racial impact assessments or equity impact assessments, and so helping counties. Um, be able to analyze what they're currently doing in terms of policy and practice that may have an um, inequitable result on youth of color. There are several counties that are undergoing um, um, race impact assessments or equity impact assessments on their probation rules. And that's been really impactful for them in terms of the process. We've also had a race equity and inclusion lead county project where we had applications from counties who really wanted to move, to move the needle on this work. And we are currently in the process of designing a policy academy. We have identified in the JDAI counties that um, warrants are the primary driver for use of secured attention for youth of color. And the policy academy is likely gonna focus on that. And so being able to help sites understand what's happening in their systems um, policies, practices that, uh, that, is, that is making that, um, um, having that inequitable outcome for youth, for youth of color. Um, this is something that is not a sprint, it is a marathon and it is, a is extremely um, um, difficult work in a lot of ways, but necessary. Um, we have known that for a long time that our youth of color are, are bearing the, the um, primary responsibility for um, not responsibility, they're bearing the primary um, burden of, of use of secured attention, as well as the deep end of the system, the out of home placements. Um, and we are committed to making a change um, in that way. I came across some data recently from the sentencing project that showed that Indiana was actually um, had made the most progress in out of home placements in terms of um, um, lessening the, the disparity gap. And I was extremely interested in that. And I'm gonna dig into that a little bit more because I do feel like we are moving in the right direction, but still have so far to go um, in Indiana. And, and that's not, I think that my guess is gonna be that Josh is probably gonna say that's the something you see across the country too. Um, we're not alone in this in this work. Yeah, and I, I will say beyond, um, I know the work that you all are doing in the JDEI sites, in the conversations that we've had with law enforcement and other stakeholders, it has been a topic that has been brought up and a number of different agencies um, have started, you know, looking at equity data more directly, more intentionally. Um, and so I think, like you said, there is movement in the right direction. Um, and we just wanted to, to center that, you know, all of the recommendations or not recommendations, all of the findings um, and use this lens of equity as well in, in how we talk about them um, and make sure that the working groups as they're thinking about recommendations, think about how the recommendations could impact um, the reduction of, of racial and ethnic disparities and actually target that issue in a more direct way. Um, we also wanted to make sure uh, to present, um, as Nina said, we'll, we'll present at the deeper end of the system, but um, the field nationally and states have often focused at that deeper end. And, and that makes sense because the, the disproportionality increases as you get deeper and, and the, the harm it causes. Um, 
but we also really wanted to inform the disproportionality at the front end of the system. Um, that's received you know, less attention until you know, probably the last year or two given recent events. Um, but it starts at that point of referral. Um, and again, this is where it ties into the broader conversation about how the juvenile justice system in Indiana is being used and whether there are opportunities that can be afforded to all kids and particularly kids of color and communities of color um, to provide those services and supports outside of the juvenile justice system. This is Steve David. I, I, I applaud the uh, conversation. Uh, unfortunately, we're ahead in the area of juvenile justice in disparity and in the racial disproportionality more so than we are in the adult criminal system, but hopefully uh, that will change soon. I think big picture thinking, it would be helpful to go a layer or two deeper uh, so we can laser focus. Uh, I think the scratching away the, the data going deeper is not gonna look good, but I think it's necessary to be able to show uh, two 15 year olds, two 16 year olds, uh, different county data uh, that the petition is for the same offense, okay? Um, and, and show the disproportionality. Uh, I think that's probably necessary to do to have the conversations because uh, there still remains a large number of people or, or too large a number of people that, that uh, want to explain that um, anecdotally. And, and so I think the next level data will help us, uh, help us be laser focused in this work. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I know um, that has also been brought up a lot when we talk about school discipline and school, the use of out of school suspensions and expulsions and uh, looking and isolating behaviors. And I think that explanation is also used there by, by schools in terms of, you know, youth of color exhibiting different behaviors and so forth and the data really bearing out that the behavior is similar, but the responses are different. Um, and I don't wanna put Emily on the spot, but we have talked about different ways to use regression analyses to be able to isolate four offenses to show that kind of disparity that you're talking about justice, David. So that is on our mind to try and do some of that work. Hopefully I didn't just put you in a, in a hole, Emily, but I think we've talked about that. <laughs> yeah, it, it is something that we're working on. It wasn't ready to go live yet, but we can, we can still continue to work on it. Nancy? Just really quickly, we do have um, data for our all of the, the 33 um, JDAI sites that um, is that demonstrates exactly what you were talking about, Nina, that when folks, um, and Justice David mentioned it too, when folks typically say, well, the reason that youth of color over represented is because they commit more serious offenses or, and it does not, um, it, it shows exactly what you said, Nina, that is not, that is not bared out, borne out in the data. Yeah, if you have any any of that, like in a report or something that we could look at, that would be great. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Um, any other thoughts um, on this section or in general, just about those four key takeaways and the various uh, data that was presented today before we turn to um, big picture next steps and thoughts for consideration? Um, okay, um, so we wanted to share, and you'll see this when we send the presentation out um, after the meeting, um, and a lot of these key questions for consideration about the front end of the juvenile justice system were questions that we've discussed throughout the presentation and the meeting. Um, but just to get folks to start thinking about how to um, potentially um, 
address some of these challenges at the front end of the system. Um, so what are the policies and practices that might be needed to focus the system on those youth that are really a risk to public safety, those higher risk youth um, that might have more needs that need to be addressed through the juvenile justice system to help juvenile justice local systems really prioritize their resources and their capacity to focus on those young people. Um, how can resources be allocated? Um, we talked about incentivizing, we talked about um, guidelines and consistency around requirements for diversion um, of youth that have status offenses or other low risk youth. So again, to uh, allow staff time and resources and capacity to be focused more on those young people that have the highest risk to reoffend and those young people that are committing the more violent offenses. Um, how can a more consistent equitable and data-driven approach um, be established in Indiana to divert young people, um, to make dispositional decisions while maintaining that local county flexibility and the opportunity to customize and innovate based on uh, every locale's unique needs and population. Um, how can young people who do not present a public safety risk but may have needs met without necessarily um, needing to have an arrest or a court referral to get access to those services. Um, and then what policies and practices might be needed to make sure that young people who are low risk are not pushed further into the juvenile justice system, including placed in out of home uh, facilities um, for probation violations when public safety is not a risk using those types of graduated responses or developing more consistent criteria um, to ensure that out-of-home placement is really used as a last resort. So we just wanted to present some key issues for consideration that this task force, but also the working group uh, will be focused on in trying to identify potential recommendations or solutions for Indiana. Um, in terms of uh, more immediate next steps, um, we're going to continue having focus group conversations over the next month or so with additional stakeholders. If anybody has thoughts on other folks that you think we should talk to, um, we'd love to have those recommendations as well as those connections. Um, so please let us know. Um, the working groups will continue to meet. As I mentioned, they've met once already to just get an overview. They'll meet again to review uh, the data from our assessment and start thinking about uh, potential recommendations and solutions. Um, as we move forward, those recommendations um, will be shared with other stakeholders as well as with the task force members all ahead of that November consensus based, uh, that, that November meeting where the group will reach consensus on recommendations to move forward on. We have our next task force meeting scheduled for October 15th. At that meeting, we'll be presenting findings from the rest of the assessment, um, which includes uh, Department of Corrections data, detention data, as well as services data. And then, the recommendations from the working groups will be shared with the task force um, for a consensus-based vote in November. And that meeting, I believe, is November 29th. I have that, yes, on the next slide. So the timeline of activities, the next uh, meeting on October 15th, continuing to develop and that recommendations through these working groups the last task force meeting on October, on November 29th, which will be a full day meeting, hopefully in person, um, if the world allows for that. And then um, subsequent to that meeting, um, any bill drafting, gathering feedback, et cetera, on the recommendations that move forward. Um, I'll stop right there. Um, obviously wanna see if my, my team of folks have anything else to add, but wanna turn to Representative McNamara, Senator Kreider, to, to also give some, some thoughts behind next steps and what you would like to see um, come out of the task force um, over the next couple of months, um, as well as um, you know, thoughts for consideration going forward. Say so once they get the um, PowerPoint, if the task force members would look at the considering opportunities front end questions that are posed. Um, not like a homework assignment to respond to them, but look through those based on your expertise and 
really help us uh, vet what some of those thoughts are around those particular bullet points. Um, the front end uh, is still, uh, unfortunately, um, Representative Cook had to go take care of a family matter, but um, on the front end system, um, we had to think about one thing uh, in that area, uh, what would it be and then how would it be in relationship to those bullet points that are presented. So if you would really take the time to look through that part, um, I would appreciate it. Yeah, and if folks have thoughts on that, they could they could share that and we could share that with uh, Representative Cook um, and Judge Gaither who are leading that front end working group so they can uh, include that in their discussions. That would be great. Sorry, Senator Kreider. Yeah, I would just encourage everybody that's um, involved in the project as you have thoughts and ideas, feel free to share them with, with any of us that are a part of the team. Um, I think the... Um, it, it's a lot. There's a lot of information that's being shared. And as you process that and you start thinking about the, the system that you work in, you may have this epiphany that that jumps out at you. And so um, I think we're, we're really hopeful that um, the consensus meeting in November will produce um, some some projects that really will allow us to take a, a substantial uh, bite at this apple. Um, I think, you know, all of us realize that this is not something that's going to happen overnight necessarily, but uh, we'd certainly like to take the momentum that we've built and and come out with um, a good recommendation and and hopefully boost some some positive legislation this next session that will help all of you folks who are working in the field um, accomplish your jobs uh, more efficiently, but ultimately serve the population that we're talking about um, well. And so continue to dig in. I, I appreciate uh, what I've seen so far. And I think we've, we've accomplished a lot to this point. And, and my hat's off to the folks from the CSG that have that have uh, done the focus groups and put the teams together. I think we've got a good opportunity here to, to do some good things. So appreciate it. Thank you. Any other thoughts, comments, reactions, um, things to think about as we continue the work, um, the working groups and the task force? Okay. Uh, well, thank you all for your time. I know it's hard. A uh, two and a half hour long data meeting on Zoom is not always the most exciting. So we appreciate everyone's uh, participation and, and the robust discussion. Um, as I mentioned, we'll send out the presentation. It is a fairly large file size. I will warn that in advance. Um, so if you don't receive it, please you know, in the next day or two, let me know and we will try and figure out another way to get that to you. Maybe we'll post it um, on the website or something. Um, we'll also share that handout um, with the map so that you can play around with that tool and look at the various county referral rates. Um, everyone has the next meeting calendar invite. Obviously, we'll make a determination there. Uh, we'll represent McNamara and Senator Kreider about the online versus in person. Um, and um, we look forward to seeing everybody on uh, October 15th. And again, in the meantime, if you have thoughts as you're looking through those questions for consideration, please share that with the whole task force, with the working group chairs, with us, and we can distribute that information. Um, we'd love to get folks to start thinking about that as soon as possible. So thank you everybody for your time. And thank you Representative McNamara and Senator Kreider for your leadership and, and everyone's participation. All right. Thank you. Take care. Thank you all.